Welcome to the 2017 Year in Review special episode of the Don't Stifle Me podcast. My name is Jacob Stiefel, and before we get to today's episode, I do want to let you know this podcast is listener-funded as of now, and what that means is instead of me reading a bunch of commercials right here or during the episode or at the end, I'm leaving it all up to you folks to decide what, if anything, I get paid for doing these episodes. So if you enjoy the talks, if you want to keep hearing more, please at least go check out patreon.com slash DSM podcast over there for as little as a dollar or three dollars a month. You can help me cover the production and publishing costs on my end. Plus, you get exclusive access to behind the scenes pictures and video that I post up there. Also, some MP3 downloads of some of the songs that I play with guests here on the episodes. And speaking of that, I did uh, this afternoon upload several new MP3s from past episodes from you know the past month or some reaching back to you know early last year when not long after I started this whole thing. And uh, once again Patreon is the only place that you can get those. So if you want to check that out that is patreon.com/dsmpodcast. And now today's episode my guest today once again is my best friend and cousin Chance Gray. In in college, when we were at the University of Alabama, Chance and I used to have a year in review party at the right before Christmas break at the end of uh, at the end of each year. So I wanted to kind of carry that over here into the podcast world and uh, end my first year podcasting with a year in review special episode. So maybe we'll do another one at the end of 2018. You never know, but I don't want to get too far in my head ahead myself here. So uh, Chance and I sat down here in the studio a couple of nights ago, had some wine, shot the shit about things we've seen and learned in 2017, a little about what we'd like 2018 to be, what we're looking ahead to. And we covered that and a lot more. Some I remember, some toward the end, not so much, but you can hear it for yourself. Here is the 2017 Year in Review podcast episode uh, with yours truly and the one and only Chance Gray. We uh, are we live? January the second, two thousand eighteen. That's when we're recording this, ladies and gentlemen. I am sitting here with the one and only Chance Gray. We're gonna we're gonna end it like we started it, even though technically the year's already over. <laughs> <clears throat> but in theory, uh, we're ending it like we started it, and then we'll start uh, the new year after you. But Chance and I are gonna sit here and talk just like we did on episode number one. And this is episode number 41. How about that? That's crazy, man. Um, that's a lot of interviews you got in there. Um, when did you start this? When I first had the idea. We were standing around. It was a little over a year ago because it was last December, December 2017. We were standing around, and I'd been, you know, I've been listening to podcasts for three or four years now, and... We were in a conversation. I remember jokingly, I said, man, Chance, you and I ought to just start us a podcast. And then just kind of laughed it off. But as the month went on, I just kept thinking about it more and more. And then I guess about this time last year, I said, screw it. I'll just just do it. So, yeah, I started thinking about it and researching it in January of last year. And then uh, started recording the first four or five shortly after that. And then... First ones came out the last week of March, I believe. So the when I came in last time, it was probably last last March. I think we did it in February. February. I think we recorded the conversation in February. Lots happened since then. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. I think the last time before I came in here, I was uh, I was getting ready to to go uh, tour manage uh, Brent Cobb for like a month what was it had right I, before you did that had i it was either before <clears throat> or after i, I, I think it was before because i was gone for like a solid month i just remember you had on your saint paul and the broken bones shirt yeah, yeah i just uh i just worked some shows with those guys uh in, in birmingham um snagged myself one of their cool shirts i'm telling i'm telling paul <laughs> um those are really nice shirts i like i still wear it it's been a great year i've had 40 
I've had 39 great conversations, and then I talk to you. <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, who, yeah. is, uh, who do you think uh, was one of your favorite conversations? Um, man, I don't know about a top one, but I think Jimbo's was really cool. Sitting in the we all the three of us sat in the hotel room in Austin. Yeah, that was uh, a good day. Jimbo's was good. My buddy Chad Prather in Fort Worth. That was a really cool conversation. Uh, man, uh, the one you and I and Matt Mackey and Cardwell did here uh, about oh, yeah. ten episodes ago. That was pretty good. That was a little foggy in my mind. I remember the first half of it at least. Um, <laughs> I was just uh, present. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you didn't say a lot that night. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you know, uh, Mad Mackey is such a an interesting character to me. I sometimes I, just gotta sit back and. I feel like when he's around, I usually just let him talk because uh, <laughs> he has great stories and a, a great outlook uh, on life and love and music. Oh man, the uh, cowboy Eddie Long, the guy that played steel guitar for Hank Jr. for like fifteen or how long was it? It was longer than that. It was like thirty years or something. Because he started with him in the early 80s, I think. Yeah, and played with him for like, so like 25 years. I don't know. We should go back and listen to it again. But he played, and he's been playing with Jamie Johnson for the last 10, 15 years. And that was the uh, uh, the guy that he had to he drink the whole bottle of uh, Jack Daniels or yeah, something. Yeah, they said uh, <clears throat> when his, his first show with Hank Jr., he played it and did great. And then afterward, they all called him into the, the back room area, and they said, all right, cowboy. We like what you did tonight, and and you got one more thing to do before you're a part of the the crew. And they handed him a fifth of Jack and said, "You got to kill this before you can be a part of us." And he turned it up and chugged the whole thing. I'm almost gonna throw up just thinking about that. Yeah, that sounds awful. <laughs> I mean, and, and I love Jack Daniels, love it very much. I would drink, I would be drinking it right now, except for that the last bottle I had had a hole in the top of it. You believe that? Had a hole in the top of it. Yeah, everything in there just came out that hole in the top. Well, I'll be. <laughs> I said that to to my granddad over Christmas because he always has a bottle of Jack Daniels at his house for Christmas. Um, I mean, it's like clockwork. It's always there. And this Christmas, I went trotting in there. I was going to get me a little Christmas Jack on the rocks. And the bottle that's always there was not there. And I went to him. I said, Granddaddy, what happened to that big bottle of Jack that you always have above the microwave? <clears throat> and he said... Well, it's a funny thing about that bottle, Jacob. The last one I had had a hole in the top of it. That's really awesome. <laughs> did uh, did you get anything uh, awesome for Christmas? Oh, I got a Sherlock Holmes book, a Thomas Jefferson book, um, some socks. I you got can't go wrong with books and socks. Yeah, they're essential. It's a it's a thirty year old Christmas if I've ever seen one. <laughs> Yeah, ten years ago, if you'd got me books and socks, I'd been real pissed. Yeah, now these I'm were very this, thankful. This year, it was the books that I asked for. <laughs> it was That's, actually yeah, on my that, list. That always helps. Yeah. Hmm. I got this fancy shirt I'm wearing. Uh, the people listening can't see it, but they can just know that it's awesome. I'll take a picture of it later and <laughs> post it and tweet it out for the folks to to see. What uh, What was your favorite thing about 2017, Chance Gray? Man, I had a lot of great, great times this year. Um, but probably going to Europe. Um, I got to go to Europe for the with, first with time. With Jason Isbell. For those of you not aware out there, so this can be a standalone podcast. You don't have to go and listen to Chance's. Uh, <laughs> Chance is the merchandise manager, supervisor, sales representative for the great Jason Isbell and the 400 unit. Yeah, yeah. Um, I really love working with those guys. Um, honestly, it's it's the best job that I, that I've ever had. Um, I, I just really I really love it. Uh, we actually leave tomorrow to go do um, a run of shows this weekend to to make up for some shows that we missed last year. And uh, we've been off for about a month or so, so I'm really glad to uh, to get back out there and see everybody. But you now know, you said <clears throat> you said this was the, your favorite job you've ever had. Yeah. Clearly, you mean sec- you, other than booking shows for me in 2012, right? I mean, that was fun. Uh, 
once we got through the initial uh, <laughs> the first six months of convincing someone to let us come play. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember uh, you coming in there and you know telling me you're going to do all this stuff and you wanted me to book your shows and uh, I said I have no idea how to book shows for a band. Uh, I think we were both pretty positive about it, though. We were both like, yeah, we can do this. I felt like I could do it. I mean, I've worked in sales since I was 17, 18 years old. Yeah. And that's basically all it is. But uh, it was trying to figure out how to cut through the noise because uh, in today's times, there's 8 million bands out there. Oh, yeah. and Everybody with a guitar and a computer. Yeah. Everybody's <laughs> sending in submissions to uh, <clears throat> these clubs and stuff and telling everybody that they're awesome and they no, really, we're good. No, really. Yeah, we're really good. Yeah. Let us come play. But it was really hard. And I remember, I think it took like six months to finally get one show. Yeah, we started trying and... Uh, sounds like we're trying to have a baby or something. We, <laughs> we started attempting to book shows in November of 2011. And April 20-something was our I'll, first show in... Uh, for some reason, I want to say it was like April 26th. It was, I was going to say 24th or 26th. We got you that show at uh, Rooster's Blues House in yeah, Oxford, Oxford, Mississippi. Mississippi. Uh, and I remember <laughs> we, <laughs> we we borrowed your dad's truck, right? Yeah, oh yeah. And we rented a U-Haul trailer. Yeah, it was five of us. Five of us packed, packed up in that thing. Uh, extended cab. Like that Alan Jackson door. song. Extended, it was yeah. really five pickers in an old Dodge truck. Yeah. Headed out to, for a show. Yeah. Uh, and I remember we got we got that first one, and we needed a second one. So I called um, Hallie Phillips down there, Muscle Shoals, and she got us in at a place called On the Rocks. Yeah, yeah. And we had like a first weekend of shows, and it <laughs> two was two shows in a row, and on it the road. was great. And then on tour, we're on tour <laughs> because we were honest when we told people that we were pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we started getting. Uh, I remember there for I seemed like the two years that I was really involved in this, uh, I don't remember anybody letting you come play and then reaching back out to me and saying, it just wasn't great. Uh, don't the come only, back. The only time that happened, I think, <clears throat> the one time is we played the Tin Roof in... <clears throat> we played the Tin Roof in Chicago, no, Cincinnati. That's where it was. We played, because we used to do the Tin Roof circuit, and played the tin roof and there was a Cincinnati Reds game that was like half a block down the street and they paid us extra to start early at nine o'clock instead of 10 because it was a Reds game that had been rain delayed. So the crowd was huge. Um, but it had been rain delayed that day. And then they got there like right about nine o'clock. So everybody was hammered and ready to party. So they paid us extra to start early. We did killer night, just rock and roll all night. People dancing, sold some merch. It was great. But by for people that have been tailgating or whatever you do for baseball games all day during the rain delay, then you go to the game and drink. Then you go to the bar afterward and start and keep pounding them. By 1 a.m., you're going to be falling over drunk. And they were. They were falling over on the stage, <laughs> and <clears throat> people were leaving early or whatever. Well, I guess the bar thought that that was our fault. And that next Monday, they emailed us and said that our show – lacked energy by the by the end of it i was like oh you mean that fifth hour that we were playing for you <laughs> yeah they don't know they don't know but uh, but that was the only time that that happened yeah most of the time i love the surprise in people's faces when we go play a show and, and we're, we're pretty good and they come they say man y'all are y'all are really good <laughs> it's like thanks <laughs> yeah it was uh i mean those were uh were trying times Looking back, I think it was a lot of fun, and and I learned a lot um, because at the time I really had like four jobs. Like yeah. I, I was going on the road and, and touring with people, uh, doing the merch thing. I was booking your shows, kind of managing the thing. I was also writing um, and just trying to really uh, increase streams of revenue. And I mean, we're still both doing that. I mean, we're, yeah, you know, I still I figure um, we'll be doing that for a while. I still have stay in this world. <laughs> two or three, two or three things I like to work on. Uh, some for money, some for my personal pleasure and my own sanity. Uh, 
Are we going to start talking about women now? <laughs> oh, no, we shouldn't. <laughs> that's, a deep, that's a deep subject. <laughs> right. Uh, we could talk for hours about that and get nowhere, I don't, I don't believe. One of the things I learned this year is that women are crazy. Well, also, men are crazy. So what you're saying is people are crazy? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah, we are all crazy because there is no normal. We're all just a bunch of weirdos. Yeah, <laughs> you just gotta find somebody. Evolutionary weird like you, screw ups, just meandering our way through the hundred or so years that we might get lucky enough to live. Yeah, pretty much. But uh, yeah, back to the, the original question. I would think the highlight of my year would would be going to Europe. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I'd never been. Um, and uh, while we were we were over there for I think it was around twenty five days, uh, I got to see so many things that I honestly, growing up, I never thought I would see. It was just stuff that you would see in books or in movies, and it seemed like a very the world at the time seemed uh, so large, and yeah. now to me, everything kind of seems so much smaller. Uh, but going over there was the highlight, and maybe the the second thing would be I, I look at last year. I, I primarily worked for for two artists. I worked with Jason, and then I worked with Brent Cobb. And both of those um, those artists are up for Grammy awards. Uh, when the, I think the ceremony is in February, but uh, that's pretty cool. I that'll patted, mark, I that'll mark two years with Isbo, right? Because didn't wasn't it like right when you started with him, you went to the Grammy thing? Yeah, I started. Um, my first show with him was February eleventh, uh, two thousand sixteen. Yeah, in uh, in Austin, and a few days after that was the the Grammy Awards, and uh, he and Amanda um, flew to L.A. for the awards, and we were held up in a hotel in uh, in Dallas, and I remember. I was just so excited and, and so thankful to be there. Uh, and then he, he wins these two Grammy Awards, and I'm sitting there with the whole band and crew, and some of these guys have been with him for, you know, two, five, seven, ten years, uh, grinding it out. And, you know, there were there were tears and people hugging and high-fiving, and I just felt really weird to be there. And I was hoping everyone wouldn't uh, look at me and be like, well, Congratulations, new guy, for showing up the week we went. <clears throat> Jumping on the ship right when things yeah. are getting good. But I couldn't help it. I, I tried to get there earlier. It just didn't work out. Luckily, I was you know, persistent uh, enough, and a few things fell into place to where I was able to get that job. But you know, looking back on this year, or uh, 2017, and realizing that I worked for two artists that are Grammy-nominated, um, not because because I just lucked into something, but because I, I love both of these artists very much, uh, I, I consider them both friends, um, to be able to, to work for these people uh, who, who make such great art uh, and do amazing things was just really, really cool to me. And I believe something that uh, if I ever have grandchildren, I would, I would tell them this, and they might re think that maybe once upon a time I was cool. <laughs> <laughs> Back in the day, uh, your old Papa Gray here. Yeah. I say another thing about your Europe trip is your photography skills, like multiplied by magnitudes of, of 10 over there. From You can t go back and, ladies and gentlemen, you should go follow Chance Gray on Instagram. What is it? At Chance Gray underscore? That is it, yeah. Uh, yeah. At Chance Gray underscore. Um, but Chance... Got him, uh, got himself, got himself, got purchased. I don't know. He purchased a new camera <laughs> <laughs> for you. Is it for your birthday? You bought yourself a camera? Yeah, I, I bought a, uh, a nice, uh, uh, or a nicer. He got a Nikon <laughs> camera. I did get it. I got a Nikon. <laughs> and, uh, you know, really the, the, the goal of it was um, I, I've long since known that I get to see and do things that a lot of people. We'll never have the opportunity to do, um, and some of it is just you know me personally wanting to document this stuff and and be yeah. able to remember it and have it somewhere.
but also, you know, be able to share it where other people can see it. And I really wasn't approaching it from uh, a photography standpoint, and I'm, I'm still not. It's it's really, it's just for me. It's something that I enjoy. I found it to be very challenging. Yeah. Uh, well, it's learning something totally new. Yeah. yeah um, <clears throat> you could tell from the time you started that Europe trip. To when you got back, your pictures were just like it was like a different person taking them. Yeah, and and I, I hope they 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 get better. Um, I do think whatever creativeness I have inside of me um, gives me somewhat of an eye for this kind of stuff. Um, but like everything, you know, you can take what little bit of talent you have, and I think if I keep working on it and and, and talking to people, and I get very lucky that. Uh, Mr. Derry de Borja, the uh, our key player with with Jason, is a is a great photographer, and a, a very uh, creative guy, and he uh, is very kind and patient with uh, answering my questions, uh, pointing me in the right direction for the kind of gear I should have and, and what my setting should be and things things to look for. Um, and I have a few other you know photographer friends that I, that I've met along the way that have kind of helped me, but. I just really enjoy it. Uh, I love if I have a day off in a in a city, or even sometimes if I just have a couple hours, I will like to just strap on my camera and go walk around and just try to take pictures of things that, that catch my eye. And some of them I I post online, and then um, I just have a ton of photos on some memory cards. I'll tell you what, <clears throat> I feel like you should drink some of that wine right there because I've just finished my glass and, and you haven't sip tears for a while oh man well you drink yours like a drunkard well, <laughs> it's just so good once it hits the lips it's just what you know we're, we're bottled down we might have to go get that second bottle here in a minute i knew you should have got that other <laughs> bottle before we got started well you know i didn't want to seem like a drunkard uh i learned this year that well i learned how to cook spaghetti squash spaghetti that I cooked us the other night, and it's really good. Uh, yeah. Chance and I have not been. Lie, uh, I was we're cousins, so it, so you know it's okay. But we've been we've been roommates for off and on for about twelve and a half years now, right? Yeah, since uh, since August of two thousand five. Yep, spanned from uh, Tuscaloosa for a few years, and then up here in Nashville since about seven years ago ish. You know, some sometimes you. Uh, you get out into the world and realize that you you need you need other people uh, to keep the dream alive. Yeah, because it's sure. it's uh, life is very expensive. It's expensive. It can be uh, it can beat you down. It can be lonely at times, and it's really uh, it's important to have close friends and family that you can lean on when you need it, and they can lean on you when they need it. And yeah, you're a you're a good positive guy too. That always helps. Uh, for a man like myself who t- tends to get down. And when I get a little bit too up in the clouds, I just go talk to you sometimes, and then you give me a little like jerk back down to reality. Yeah, I can bring everyone back down to reality, <laughs> I, I believe. So uh, you come back naturally. I'm pretty sure your dad was the same way, is the same way. Yeah, yeah, very uh, very honest man. <laughs> uh, never really sugar-coated anything. Oh, what else did I learn this year, ladies and gentlemen? I learned that, uh, I, I, well, see, I shot a deer in Mississippi and brought it back here and cut the meat off, and or cleaned it down there, cut the meat off, processed it, got it all made into some ground venison and cooked it all myself. Figured out how to do that. It was good. I, I, I feel like uh, the last year or so you've been on this, this journey of uh, really expanding – things of like who you are as a person uh all the information you've retained from uh these podcasts uh the health uh, and fitness journey that you've been on for for several years yeah, uh, i feel like on my i have a, a i have a separate fitness instagram um if you're interested out there it's at john h no see what's my name it's at john j stiefel and but anyway so on there in the profile thing, it just says like podcaster, songwriter, brother, uncle, son, human, and some other stuff or whatever. But then it just says trying to be the best of all of those. And that's what I've 
feel like I'm trying to do? What can I do to be a better Jacob Stiefel? What can I learn? How can some new foods? You give me shit all the time about eating the same foods all the time because I'm trying to be healthy and I only have like a few things in my repertoire. So I've consciously the last couple of months been trying to stretch it out there and find some new things. I'm really just jealous because I don't, I don't have the discipline to do it. <laughs> Chance sits here on the couch and he's like, I'm hungry. Yeah. I haven't bought groceries in a couple of months, so I can I'll I can go to Taco Bell. I can work out and and eat better than anybody for about a month. <laughs> yeah, and uh, <clears throat> then life happens, and you, you miss that one day. You're like, ah, I'll just go tomorrow. A day and, turns into a week. Yeah, and then it gets like three weeks, and you're like, man, if I go back today, it's going to kill me. And so you just don't go. And then the next thing you know. You've been paying thirty bucks a month for a gym membership, <laughs> and you've you've went you know uh, two months out of the year. Well, at least you're not doing crystal meth. That's that's true. There's my positivity coming back, coming back to you. That's a good that's a good thing not not to be on the, the crystal meth. I believe, uh, even though uh, a, a couple years ago uh, I went home for some holiday or some occasion. I think it was in the summertime, and I was hanging out by my dad's pool. And uh, before I left, he he told me I <clears throat> I should watch my weight. That uh, maybe I was getting was getting too big and uh, should take care, better care of myself. And it really hurt me. And I was like, okay, whatever. And uh, I just came back up here and, and continued on with my normal life. I went back like a year later, and I really don't know what had changed. But before I left this time, he goes, "You're not uh, you're not on that meth, are you?" <laughs> And I was like, well, last year I was too fat. This now, year I'm too skinny. Now I look like I'm, you know, I'm too skinny. <laughs> I really, I don't know, you know, is there a desirable weight you would like me to be at that we could stop this conversation and these questions that really bother so. me? Just the parental worrying, I believe. I guess, I guess so. But uh, I mean, I, I guess <clears throat> I should be thankful to have p- parents that did care. <laughs> Another thing I learned in 2017 is that the myths about Washington, D.C. crime are not myths at all. If you go there and you park in a parking garage, there is a possibility that your car is going to get busted into and they're going to steal some stuff. Yeah. I know it happened to me. It's almost like I don't, I don't really understand it all, but it, it seems to be a little sad to me that uh, our nation's capital is really one of the most dangerous places in the country. Statistically, I believe yeah, I think, it's, uh, it's up there on the list. And I've, I went there a few months ago for the first time ever, and I mostly stayed around the National Mall, which is like the Jefferson Memorial, the Lincoln Memorial, the U.S. Capitol Building, the White House, all that whole area right there. Like Roy Moore? So, whew, we'll get, in, get into that. <laughs> uh, but I went there, and, and I looked around, and it was all right in, that er- in those areas. But one day I did – borrow uh, rent one of the bicycles and rode about a mile down the street in in like the southeast direction or so and the further i went i was like oh this is the this is the part of town that i hear stories about so i ate the fantastic tacos at that mexican restaurant and then quickly bicycled back to my friend's condo i'd say if you're a man into riding bicycles where you need to go is holland holland oh yeah i was yeah. in a couple places over there <clears throat> Um, but I, I remember, um, in, in Amsterdam, I'd never seen so many bicycles in my whole life. And I never thought that, uh, my greatest fear in life, uh, at 32 years old would be getting ran over by a bicycle, by a bicycle. <laughs> but they were everywhere. Uh, you know, there's cars and trains and bicycles going in all directions. So when you walk around over there, you really have to keep your head on a swivel. Yeah. <clears throat> I've never been overseas. I've never been out. I've never been out of the country. I haven't even been. I've never been to Canada or Mexico or anything. It was cool. I got to cross off. Uh, I think nine different countries um, in in the month that that I was gone. Um, anyway, it was really cool. Um, another thing. I'm just looking at some notes here from from all these talks that I've had in the forty uh, podcast episodes. Is that And I kind of knew this anyway, but there's a large majority of of really cool people that uh, that were in the high school band, contrary to small town beliefs. Like a lot of the people that I talked to that are 
cool, awesome people and musicians and do really cool things with their lives were like band geeks and band nerds, quote unquote, or whatever. Yeah, it's uh, it's really a tough rap the the uh, high school band people sometimes get. Uh, I I don't think this is true <coughs> everywhere, but uh, in the small little portion of the world I grew up in in Alabama, um, if you were in the band, you weren't cool. Yeah, you were you were the weird. Yeah, and uh, I didn't think anything about it at the time. I was just a kid, you know. Trying to fit in. <laughs> trying to fit in yeah. and, uh, you know, get some girl to like me. Or, yeah, they were, like man, look, they were, they were ahead of the curve. They were more in touch with, this is who I am. I'm going to be this, whether it's cool or not. They were. I, Things I, I'm learning at 30 years old. <laughs> I've also uh, learned in the last six or seven years of traveling around with a, with a lot of bands, um, you know, there there are some sports and, and some football people there. I'm a big college football guy. Uh, that's be my favorite. But, uh, I've, you know, a lot of these guys hold great resentment to, to sports yeah. and, and to, to jocks. I was about to say, you think it's because of the people that played sports? and I, I certainly think that's some of it. I think a, a few of the people um, that I'm thinking about in my mind, you know, have, have told me, you know, they hold resentment for these people because they, you know, the football players were mean to them. Yeah, in high school, and uh, there's just well, sure there's just no reason for that. I don't think I personally took part, but I'm sure that I was standing in crowds that made fun of band people because I was hanging. I mean, I played football all through school, hung out with the the quote unquote jocks or whatever. So I'm sure at some point that was going on. Oh. But you know, I'm like you. I was just hanging out trying to fit in and, and be likable speaking of your your high school football <clears throat> days um one of your your high school football coaches just got named the head football coach of the university of tennessee that he did right? yes mr jeremy pruitt is now the tennessee vols head coach i'm not going to wear a tennessee garment uh nor will i you know verbally root for tennessee but if he were to win some games I would be okay with that as long as it's not against Alabama or Georgia or Vanderbilt or. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna gonna keep Alabama Number first, schools, but yeah. uh, you know, so one of my family members asked me uh, last week, you know, Christmas, what I thought about it, and uh, I really couldn't be more happy for the guy. Yeah, There's honestly, not- like I joke about it, but he went from coaching at Plainview to you know tiny t- you know in a tiny tiny town in northeast Alabama to coaching at Fort Payne, which is just a tiny town. <laughs> you know, that's where I where I went to school. He was my defensive coordinator in high school for three years. So he went from there to Birmingham to Hoover. To Hoover. Where he was they on the that, uh, two that days. Key. Yeah, you was remember the asparagus thing? Oh yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Jeremy Pruitt, I'm happy for you. But there was an episode of Two Days, the show it was M T V, was that what it was on? I yeah, I think right. it was on yeah. MTV. So it was about the Hoover then. High School football program in Birmingham, Alabama. And there was an episode, Jeremy Pruitt was, was he the defensive coordinator there? I think so. I, anyway, I really he was know. a football coach at, at Hoover High School. And he went out to eat dinner with a player and the player's parents at this nice restaurant in Birmingham. And the waiter brought out a plate and – Jeremy Pruitt said, and I'm paraphrasing because I can't remember exactly, but he said, what's that? <laughs> and the waiter was like. It was very country. It's, yeah. It was very country. Said, it's, uh, it's steamed <laughs> asparagus. I and think he said, I don't even know what that he is. He said, I never heard of that. <laughs> yeah. So I will continue to chuckle about that. But going from all of that to now making, what, like $3.8 million a year or something like that? Uh, I don't know. It's It's a little bit more than I'm making. Yeah, <laughs> we did the math. Chance and I did the math on it yesterday, and it's roughly ten thousand dollars a day. That's every not, day that's not for a, bad a year. Day. Yeah, um, but yeah, I, I I I'm very proud of the guy. I, I wish yeah. him all the best. His family, uh, they're good people, uh, and I, I think that's just amazing for a small town kid who, you know, I'm sure that's probably always been his dream. The way uh, some people to aspire to win a Grammy award or some, something like that, that, that was his yeah. path and the, the, he worked for it and he struggled for it and he achieved it. Um, it's one of the most amazing things ever. And I, I really, uh, I really hope I get to sit down sometime and, and talk to him. Cause I have some questions I'd like to ask him. I'd lo- I'd really love to interview him. Yeah. 
We should uh, we should get him on the podcast. Maybe so. Uh, he's kind of got his hands tied. Right <laughs> yes, now. right. Yeah. I don't know if he really wants to. He's come. about to be a defensive coordinator for the national championship with Alabama, while he's also planning for next year's football season with Tennessee. Yeah. So I don't really know how excited he would be to come sit at our house and talk to me. <laughs> but if he said yes, that'd be real cool. What if he said, man? I'd love to do it. Y'all just come on over here to Knoxville. We'll uh, we'll walk you through the practice facility, and we'll give you some free Tennessee Vols T-shirts, <laughs> and you could uh, sit in the box at the football game. Hey, man, I'd take them. I'd, I'd I'll, I always take free swag. Yeah. <laughs> when I was out with uh, doing Taylor Swift a couple years ago, we would do all these um, NFL stadiums and, and arenas and stuff like that, and I really I have shirts and, and clothes from – teams that i i would never ever support uh <laughs> and people ask me like i didn't know you were a 49ers fan like i'm not i'm a fan of free shirts yeah free free stuff can't be free man jeremy pruitt sand mountain alabama yeah it's a it's an awesome thing it's really it's, uh i like to see anybody succeed actually um everybody's success is amazing um to me because it's not easy. We're all just trying to figure it out. That's one of the one of the bigger things that I've learned from from these podcasts and conversations and meeting people, talking with people that I've known before or that I've just met that day right before we talked. Like the similarity between us all. We're all different of course, but we're all very similar in how we are chasing something that we're passionate about and that we'll go through the bullshit to get to something that makes us happy and hopefully makes us money someday. If when you can combine those two things, it's magical, magical, but how similar people's stories are from luck and coincidence to hard work, preparation, uh, how it all just kind of gels in some form or fashion. Yeah. It's an amazing thing. I definitely, uh, I believe there's a, a sweet spot in life and I don't know if I've, pull this out of some book somewhere if I just made this up but I, I really feel that if you're a person who can combine um, your passion and your talents and those can meet at the crossroads of money you're living in a very sweet spot in life because I know a lot of people who maybe they make lots of money but they hate what they do Yeah. or I know a lot of people who hate what they do and don't make any money yeah. Um, or like some people that are maybe really good at something, but they're not passionate about it. Like you're like, like, like you said, they make money. They're really good at something, but they're no longer passionate about it. Like there's probably people I know there is. There's people that are playing music right now, either as an artist or a musician that maybe they're really good and they've gotten to the point to where they're making money, but they don't love it like they used to, you know? They're not passionate about it. So if you can find some way to keep all three of those things, yeah, you, get, you got it figured and, out. And, uh, you know, if those things change. Uh, I see in myself, uh, when I moved here, I had a few things I wanted to do and kind of had my heart set on. But when you actually get here and get your hands into stuff and start doing things, um, you know, you, you get to the top of the ridge and you peek over and you see what it's like where you want to go. Yeah. And then you go... Oh, I don't really want no part of that. So I Man, better, it's like I've, change. I've brought it up in, in numerous of you know, podcast episodes, but that Neil Gaiman, um, he's the author, comic, comic book author, or whatever you call it, uh, graphic novelist, I think is what the the term is. But he that commencement speech that he gave to where he talked about you know chasing a, a career in something you're passionate about is like walking toward a mountain and. Along the way, any decision that you make, you should think, is that going to lead me closer to the mountain? And if not, no. If so, yes. But along the way, you also might say, hey, I like that mountain better than this mountain. Maybe I should go over there instead. Yeah. And then so I feel like that's, that's so true. I watched, We watched that video a couple of years, two, three, four years ago, something like that. And I remember hearing that thinking, oh, that's a good point. But, and it just gets more and more true. Yeah, for sure. Um, thing things change. Yeah, well, sometimes you uh, 
my uncle one time gave me the, the keys to life, and I, I think he stole it out of a movie or something. But he told me it was to uh, adapt, improvise, and overcome. And I've just yeah. always tried to do that because it seems to be the, the people that I, that I view as the most successful were people who they adapted and they, they changed, and you have to kind of learn to roll with the flow and take into account that some things don't exactly happen the way you would you would plan it out in your mind. Yeah. You, you got to change. You got to roll with it. Yeah. But it can so quickly change. Like, who knows? Who knows what could happen tomorrow when we wake up here? We get a phone call or email that changed our life. We may not even wake up. That's true. <laughs> that's, that's unfortunately true. Yeah. I hope that don't happen. <clears throat> but uh, it's possible. Well, okay. So that's all talking about 2017. What do you hope happens in 2018 what do you want to see happen what do you want to work on uh career wise life wise man for me um personally uh in 2018 uh i i feel like i'm I'm on a good train that it's moving somewhere and uh i just want to keep the train rolling i feel like the the things that i've that i've done and accomplished and been fortunate enough to be a part of um, for the last six, seven years, um, has finally built enough, you know, speed and steam where it's just, it's moving. And I just really want to keep, keep things moving in a, in a positive, in a good direction and not take my foot, uh, off of the gas pedal. Uh, and I'm also, you know, I'm going to look at, uh, maybe trying to buy a house in 2018. Oh. That's something I, you know, I've kind of always wanted to do, but I've never, um, I've never felt settled. I, I, I could have done it, you know, 10 years ago. Um, and I thought about it and I had people tell me like, Hey, you're, tw- you're 23, 24 years old. You're, you're making good money. You, you buy a house. And that crazy to think about. And some people do that and it's fine. But like in our lives, looking back, well, for, 23 for, and 24, I'm like, Oh Lord. Man. For me, I just, I knew that my, um, I wasn't done shuffling my shoes yet. <laughs> yeah. Uh and uh I I always felt that I that I might move to Nashville or move to somewhere and, and do something else. So I was always uh avoidant of getting myself into, you know, buying really big things. Yeah. Um, I remember you told me when we moved in here, you were like, This is really the first place that you felt like a home, like it was your home, like yeah, excited to come home, come back from tour because this was home feeling. Yeah, and I, I was also um, avoidant of, of serious relationships for a while. Yeah, that was a that was a conscious thing that was going on in my mind of telling myself, I'm not sure I will ever move. It is in the back of my mind. I might do it, and if I were to pull the trigger on this, if I had a really nice home and a big truck and a nice boat and a wife and maybe two kids. That dream is just almost kind of shot. Oh, yeah. Uh, not to say it's not possible. There are pl- plenty of people who do And not to say that those things are nice things. Those are nice things. Oh, they're very nice things. Yeah. I want those things. Yeah. Um, but I, I really felt it, at the time I should just, I needed to keep doing what I was doing and, and keep on keep on moving um, to keep my own dreams alive. Yeah. I think one of the things... <clears throat> I wrote down here that I want to, looking ahead to 2018, what I want to work on and, and continue to work on is is the balance in life. Because I feel like that's, that's it's tricky for me sometimes, is that balancing music and aspirations with that, with podcasts and new things, but also health and fitness and, and working out, and then relationships as they come and go, as they do, uh, like all yeah. those things. Most, trying to find most of them go <laughs> <laughs> from experience. It would it would seem so, um, but trying to find the the sweet spot, like we were talking about, like the of balance between those things. I, I guess that's just part of life. But trying to find the balance in life is one of the hardest things I've ever tried to do. Yeah, but I feel like that's that's life. In a yeah, nutshell, I, I, it's, it's yeah. constantly going through and trying to find the balance between this and this. And it's this just, and uh, this. it's part of it. It's, uh, it's also realizing that uh, 
happiness and sadness only come in moments. Yeah. There are moments of, of extreme happiness, and then the next day something terrible happens, and you think it's the worst thing in the world, and you suck it up, and dust, as my mom say, dust your britches off and go yeah. on. And then a week later, you might meet somebody that just makes the next month and a half the happiest ever. Yeah. And then something shitty might happen again. You know, it's just kind of, like you said, it all happens in moments and trying to find the balance of remembering the good during the bad and remembering the bad during the good. Yeah. Every time something really awesome happens to me, I try to soak it in as much as possible with uh, with the thought in the back of my mind that this is going to go away. Yeah. And then when something terrible happens, I try to find some kind of strength to shake it off because... Also, in the back of my mind is that thought that this is going to go. It'll away. get better. Yeah, Some, it'll go away. Something amazing is going to happen at some point. Uh, that's just it's the here and now. That's, that's just what we life. have. That's all we have is right now, sitting here at this table, talking into these microphones with nobody else in the room. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, what. A, and what a beautiful thing that is. This is great. We can talk to you know who, who knows anywhere from six people to. Six uh, hundred thousand people could hear this, you know. And I was from a from a world standpoint, I, you know, I I've never really saw myself as someone who could like change the world or or whatever. Um, but my my part, I believe, is is to is to be positive and to be kind to other people and and love love everyone. Um, I've never personally for myself, you know. I've never needed uh, a government or a God to tell me to love other people. Yeah, and to, and to, you should be nice to people. And to treat other people as I would like to be treated. And, and I hope, you know, I kind of wish more people would develop this, this mentality and, uh, you know, and help other people that, that need to be helped if you, if you can. You know, one of the things that I've always tried to do is pull myself up to a certain point in life where I could turn around and reach out my hand to someone else and pull them up too. Yeah. Um, I was listening to a, a speech earlier that our mayor, Megan Barry, gave at the Nashville Rotary Club meeting here in Nashville. And one of the things she said, she was talking about Nashville as a whole, but she was saying that she believes one of the reasons that Nashville is so successful is that we, we ask – what what can I do for you instead of what can you do for me? Which, in my head, I'm thinking, I wish that would spread in the music community a little bit. But uh, just, just everywhere. Yeah. But, I, yeah, I think everybody would benefit from thinking that, that way. What can, you know, what can I do? What can Jacob, what can I do to help somebody that's walking down the street or whatever, you know? And it's, yeah. it's, it's all the golden rule, man. It's, it's. Basically, yeah, everything. Kind it's of cliche, to and people say it all the time, but it's how we should all wake up and live every day is what. How would I want to be treated? Okay, that's how I'm going to treat this person. I mean, you just have to, to treat people to good, you know. <laughs> yeah. As, as good as you can, and just and love people and love everybody. And, uh, you know, sometimes people ask me, you know, when I'm out on the road, like, you know, what is – something that, that changed my life or some kind of big big point or whatever. And I, I always say traveling. Um, and when I moved to Nashville, touring and traveling wasn't really part of the plan at all, and it just kind of happened. But it's probably the most defining thing that has ever happened to me because, uh, you know, I was, was born and raised in a, a very small place of the world um, where most everyone – does the same things and they they think the same way and they they do things the same way and it works and it's yeah. awesome but i always had this thought that uh maybe other people in the world know what's up too they just do things differently so being able to travel around um the US and, and now going to Europe i always try to spend time with people um that i meet along the way and figure out you know how they do things and why they do things and compare it to to what i'm doing and see if maybe i shouldn't uh be open-minded and maybe change what i'm doing a little bit 
Borrow, um, borrow a little bit from them. Yeah, yeah I'm a, uh, I'll, I like I'll the way they it. did that right there. I'll just take a little bit of that and yeah. add that to my my life. I think that's uh, yeah, that's one of the greatest things. And we've talked about this on several of these podcasts, but about one of the greatest things I've learned is is from traveling and meeting all kinds of different people, how different cultures work and religions and thoughts and beliefs and sciences and. Yeah, it's an it's an eye opening thing. And like growing up, I remember you know you meet people here and there. They're like, man, you got to get out of this small town. You got to go see the world. It's so different, cool out there. And I did that. I I, I took the advice and I, I went out and I, I've seen a lot of things. I've been a lot of places, talked to a lot of people of all different walks of life, um, and it, it's all been very beneficial to me to experience these things. But also. Uh, as much as you should get out into the world and go see the big cities and all this kind of stuff, I believe also people should go to the country for a little while. Mm -hmm. I wish I could send everyone I know down to my dad's farm for a month yeah. to work and to live <clears throat> and to see how, you know, things are, things are done. Yeah. <laughs> Most people don't know those things. Yeah. The hard work, I heard somebody talking the other day about, a hundred, hundred and fifty years ago, it was super common for people to see animals die, like to see a chicken die because you're going to eat that later or whatever, yeah. like to see animals being slaughtered and prepared. And because that's where our food comes from, came from, comes from, still does, whatever. And it's done terribly in some areas now, but just, the, but that's, they were talking about how all the things that we experienced 100, 150 years ago, like similar to what you're saying, that you saw the work that went into yeah, I think it would just building give, the barn uh, or whatever. You know. The same way as getting out in the world gave me a broader, more wholesome view of everything. I believe people that, you know, if you've always been raised in uh, Portland, Oregon, or New York City, or, or wherever, uh, yeah. if you went down to a little town of a thousand people out in the country somewhere and stayed for a while, uh, you'd learn some, learn some you, things too. I yeah. bet you learned some things about yourself and about the world. And some of it you'd like, and some of it you wouldn't. Yeah, but the you, door definitely swings. Yeah, both ways. you'd learn some things. Yeah, I think <clears throat> we should all, and I'm guilty of this as anybody, but I feel like we should all go out into nature more. I feel without your phone on, checking your Facebook notifications or whatever, like just go out and sit on a rock in the trees. Oh yeah, there's no yeah. doubt I should do more of that. That's because all. That's, that's also. Uh, that, I think that's a new goal. That I'm gonna write that down right now. That I've just made for for 2018 is uh, to come up with some new hobby because what happened in my life is I've always just been uh, in love with music, um, and not to like every everyone loves music. I've really never met a person that says I don't like any kind of songs whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I always felt my my love for it ran deeper. You know, I wanted to play it. I wanted to to write it, to be around it. I enjoy the the marketing, the PR, the advertising, the the booking of shows, the sponsorships, um, the grind of it, the business of it. I I really enjoyed Just the that. industry as a whole. The Just industry the, as a whole. Yeah. I, I I really I, I'm fascinated by all facets of it. The, you know. The accountants, there's lawyers, there's people who just answer the phone. You know, yeah. there's all kinds of things that you, you can do in this world. And that was my passion and my hobby, and I made it my life. And for the last seven years, um, I've been f focused on nothing but music. My whole life is surrounded by music. If I'm not on tour, maybe I'm sitting around writing a song or maybe I'm in the studio with you or helping you book shows or doing all these different kinds of things. And uh, now kind of going back to the balance thing that we were talking about earlier. Yeah. Out, I know. feel like I, I've lost the balance a little bit and yeah. you know, maybe if I picked up hunting or fishing or, or golf or putting H hiking, hiking, could, yeah. putting puzzles together, woodworking, just any, anything uh, would be beneficial. Ladies and gentlemen, if you me. have any ideas, uh, for for chances new hobbies, you can send those to uh, Jacob at don't me dot com, or you can go follow Chance on any of the social medias. He is on them all at Chance Gray underscore on Instagram and Twitter. 
Yeah, yeah, they're the same. And uh, Adam on Facebook, he likes the uh, messages from girls. <laughs> no offense, guys. Some some of them. <laughs> uh, there's been been some I didn't really like at all. <laughs> oh well, let's see. Anything else? Um, 2017 or 18? You know, <clears throat> 2017 was a good year. Uh, for me, like the year for me, you know, pers- personally, I, I had a good year. It may even be my best year ever, and I would just like to carry those things, uh, y- you know, into into twenty eighteen, and and just keep keep going and and keep doing what I'm doing. And uh, one thing that I really have to work on with myself is the whole comparison thing. Yeah, uh, it's very easy for me to sit down in the middle of the day on tour and be bored and start looking at everybody's Instagram and be like, man, you know, this person's on top of a mountain and this person's at the, at the I beach. I like that's all of us. That's with all society friends, as a yeah. whole. Yeah. Somebody just bought a, you know, an awesome new house or a brand new car. Yeah. Like everybody's, you know, posting their highlight reels and stuff. And it's very easy to look at those things yeah. and then, you know, make yourself sad. Yeah. I saw <laughs> a, a meme or something uh, talking about that the other day. It said, don't compare someone else's highlight reel to your behind the scenes. And that's basically what you're doing. You're looking at somebody yeah. else's the best thing that they can post. And you're comparing that to what's going on in your head. I think most people do this. <clears throat> yeah. And I, I do really believe that, um, uh, comparison is the thief of yeah. happiness. It's certainly, it's certainly one of, one of them. Uh, it's not, it's not a good thing, but I believe we all, we all do that. Just, culture that we've created here yeah and it's so unfortunate because like there's 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 room and success for a lot of people like just because somebody else succeeds doesn't mean that you or i won't succeed yeah and i've also believed that uh success is is relative to to each individual oh yeah 100 percent. you know some people might be like you know success is making a half million dollars a year and uh, buying a Porsche. That's awesome. For some people, success is uh, going to bed every night with a clean conscience and knowing that you can get up tomorrow and uh, go do things you, you like with people you like and, and just be able to survive. Like it, it's, dif- it's different for everyone. And I, I've always you know, made a point to try to respect everyone's level of success and then try to push people away from um putting their ideas of success on me <laughs> right yeah that's that's the tricky thing i'm the only one who can can decide if both i'm ways. successful or if i'm happy but both ways like and i've i've fought with this um is because the way yours and my brains are wired chasing something you know a, a career and something we're passionate about it's not necessarily how everyone's wired there are people who are passionate about making sure their kids have food to eat and their wife and and kids have a a roof over their head. And however they can do that is fine with them. Yeah. You know, there's guys that whatever, maybe they, maybe they don't love being a welder, but they are good at welding and can make good money doing that. Yeah. And I'm not a welder because I was terrible at it. (laughs) It was absolutely horrible. I took shop in high school, but I was a, I guess I was kind of a TA, teacher's assistant, and didn't have to do all the things that they had to do in shop class as long as I just ran errands for the teacher. Oh, of course you were. <laughs> Smiled and, you know, told him some of my, <laughs> some of my good jokes. Did I tell you about the preacher uh, the, that gave the sermon on theft? I don't think so. My, <clears throat> my granddaddy, Steve, told me this joke. This is, a, this is a great, great one to tell you. I can't wait. All right. Uh, so this preacher goes into church on Sunday morning, gets up in front of the, the congregation. He says, ladies and gentlemen, welcome in. Good morning. Uh, today, I, I have to inform you that somebody has stolen my bicycle. So today I'm going to preach on the Ten Commandments. And when I get to Thou Shalt Not Steal, then I want the guilty party to stand up, admit your guilt, give me my bike back, and and you'll be <laughs> absolved or whatever. You'll be forgiven. 
So he commits to to the preaching. He gets, you know, don't take the Lord's name in vain. Don't kill nobody. Uh, I don't know the order that they go in, but it's it's something. And he gets to adultery and says, you know, you shouldn't shouldn't do that and and everything and ends the sermon and says, all right, that's it. Ladies and gentlemen, have a blessed week. We'll see you next Sunday. And so on the way out, he, you know, he's shaking everybody's hand at the door. Everybody's walking out of the church and one of the one of the members of the congregation said, Reverend, you said you were going to preach on theft and somebody stole your bicycle. He said, oh, halfway through the sermon, I remember where I put the dang thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> oh, man. So, um, you know, you, you've conducted uh, how many of these interviews? 40? This is 41. It's 41, so. so 40. Uh, 39 other people besides right. me yeah. you've talked to. Um, what is, uh, is there a, do you find like a, when you talk to these people, there's a, a common theme maybe in their stories or is there something you're looking for, you're trying to to pull out from people or, or do you notice that in, in all these interviews that there's one or two things that maybe all these people have in common? Yeah, I would, I would say kind of like I mentioned earlier is that, yeah, we're all different, but but almost all the stories, whether it was, you know, Eric Breisch, who's a uh, visual artist in out of San Antonio, or you know, any of the songwriters or musicians and people that I've talked with, or Chad Prather, who's a com, you know comic slash motivational speaker in Fort Worth, like no matter the front that you're on, it was a very there was a lot of similarity between everybody in that just they knew what they were passionate about and they chased after it. And most of them had to go through a lot of shit or are still going through a lot of shit. But I noticed at the end of a lot of the conversations, I would ask people what are like, if you could go back to yourself at 18, 19 years old, what would you tell yourself or what advice would you give? And so many of them in some way resembled, just keep going. Like it's going to be okay. You'll get through the hard times. Um, just, just basically some form of keep going, keep chasing it. Don't, don't quit. Uh, and <clears throat> one of the things I've loved about this is that, and I want to keep up, is that I am talking with people who have been there, done that, and have had success. But I also want to make sure that I'm also talking with people that are in it, that are currently, you know, waist deep in the muck of the business and the industry and the, the, maybe the hard times, maybe the mediocre times, but the people that are currently doing it. Cause I've had several messages on Facebook or whatever from people that have listened to these podcasts and listened to the episodes and sent me messages and said, Hey man, I really enjoy what you're doing. I just moved to town, just moved to Nashville and I'm, I'm going to be a songwriter and it's great to hear these stories of people who have done it. And that's, that's exactly why I wanted to start doing this. Exactly. Because I wanted something that when I moved up here in 2009, when you moved up here in 2010, what would we want to have listened to to get a, a real idea of what the hell's going on? Yeah. And I man, I did that, I guess, in 2010. I don't podcast, uh, I guess, were a thing at the time, but not. Not so not, much here. Yeah, not so much yeah, here. Yeah. Not, not very big at all. Uh, and I, I remember when I moved here, I was just desperate for knowledge. I yeah. would have listened to anything, talk to people. Well, you ended up I, buying a bunch of books. I read a read? shit yeah. ton of, of books. Um, but like so much of that, and when I was starting this, like that was on my mind a lot because so much of those books and whatever, books, blogs, whatever you want to read, so many things just say, so they moved to Nashville and then uh, six months later, they got their first management and record deal or whatever. It was just like would skip over details of the story, like how things happen and the connections. And so that's the yeah. coolest part about all this is he, getting to hear somebody say, oh, well, yeah, my cousin knew somebody's manager. So they got me in through that way or hearing like what actually happens. Yeah. And I think that's uh, that's the cool thing uh, about all podcasts and, and this one, too, is is talking about those things that people really want to know because there's um, a certain part of the news is is it has to be sold. 
Yeah. That's a, they're just a business, and they're trying to make money. Uh, that's why you see all these enticing headlines and stuff, and you kind of only, you only get the the things that are are good for uh, readership and, yeah. and ratings, <laughs> yeah, and and things like that. But it, it's hard to uncover the whole truth in things like this because you know a lot of these times people will write an article and throw some headline out there, and it makes you want to read it, and you read the whole story and go that was really let down. Yeah, but they suckered you in. They, you, they got you to click on it. So yeah, that's all you, that matters. Well, yeah. yeah, they got their clicks up. They got what they're going for. Their advertisers are still giving them money. They're all everybody goes home happy. Yeah, well, yeah. That is the coolest thing about the the podcast world that we're in is that it can just be honest, real conversations about whatever. Yeah, we can say whatever we want. That's but true. I, li- I like that. And uh, uh, I guess the, the last question I, I would have for you <laughs> is. Uh, if there was one person that you could uh, bring in here, sit down, and do this podcast with you, who would it be and why? Hmm. Well, that's a good one. I think about this. I wish I had some Jeopardy music that I could cue in the background. <laughs> Maybe one day you can get a producer yeah, and, uh, right, yeah. and do those things. I need a powerful Jamie. Um, young Jamie. Let's see. I guess I would. I would have to say... Willie Nelson. And not just because it's Willie Nelson. Of course, that would be great just to talk with the man, the myth, the legend. But one of the coolest things to me about him is that he didn't see quote unquote success as a songwriter and artist until at least mid to late thirties. You know, when, when he wrote like crazy and hello walls and all that stuff in the late sixties. Um, so he didn't, you know, he struggled for a long time and he came along at a time when the tides were changing. He kind of helped change a lot of things. But I, I would, because I'd be interested to hear his take on the current state of music and with social media and with everything that goes into it now. It's not like writing songs and recording them and playing shows. Like, that's not all yeah. you have to do. So I would be interested to hear what he would say, like, if he was coming along at this time. What his thoughts would be? Maybe I'll uh, maybe I'll text Willie after this. See if we can get him in here. Text old Will. <laughs> we like to call him Will around here. <laughs> he's like our <clears throat> he's like our friend. <laughs> if you if you could bring somebody in and talk to them, who would it be, and why? Oh man, um, turned it on you, turned it around on he you. There, did. Uh, it's not my podcast. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I really uh. Jason? John I Prime, I, John Prime would be wow. a great one. I would, great. I would love to to talk to that guy, uh, and I would have to do some prep work. Oh yeah, yeah. To, to figure out exactly what what questions I I would I would want to ask. But what a uh, what an amazing songwriter, and uh, I'm sure he's an incredible guy as well. I've been in the room with him a couple of times. I've seen him, but. Uh, Never, never really talked. What's to the him. Uh, What's the name of that album that we listen to all the time? Diamonds are for diamonds. What, what is it? Diamonds the rough. Diamonds in the rough. Diamonds are forever. It's a James, that's Bond, a James movie. Bond movie. Yeah, good yeah. call. Both, um, both good things. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, it was a great 2017. 2018 is going to be even better. I, I have faith in that. If you have that attitude, I think it will be I pretty believe, good. I believe so. Your homework, people, is to. Uh, well, do whatever you want to do, but <laughs> but you should also you should listen to the John Prine album Diamonds in the Rough, and you should either tweet or email or Facebook or something some ideas for Chance and his new hobbies that he should he should work on this year. Boy, this order be interesting. <laughs> uh, well, thanks for sitting down and drinking wine. And and talking with me about about these. Yeah, these I wasn't things. going to do it till you said we could have wine uh, <laughs> during the conversation. You, Chance, what do you what do you call a nosy pepper? Got no idea. Jalapeno business. Oh jeez. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening, folks. Thanks for talking, Chance. You bet. There it was. There we were. Thanks for listening. 
I hope you had a great, awesome 2017. I'm, I'm so happy that I started this podcast, and I sure don't plan on quitting anytime soon. I'm sure as time goes on, like all things, it will evolve and go where it needs to go. And so if you have any ideas or any critiques or any requests or whatever, please send those my way, whether it's on Facebook or Instagram, or you can email me personally at jacob at don'tstifleme.com. I want this to be the best that it can be for all of us involved, and that definitely includes you people out there listening. So I do recommend that you all go follow at Chance Gray underscore on Instagram and make sure you, you like and comment on his fantastic pictures that he takes and posts. You should all listen to Jason Isbell's music because it's just some of the greatest shit that's out there right now. And definitely ooh, go check out that John Prine album that I mentioned earlier. The, uh, it's called Diamonds in the Rough. And it is, it's, you know, it's magnificent. So anything else, anything else that we brought up in, in that conversation that you either were aware of or forgotten about, go check that out. Um, if you enjoyed this talk or any of the talks that I've had and I've been lucky enough to be a part of in this past year, then most importantly, subscribe to the podcast here wherever you're listening to it. And secondly, if you want even more access, maybe some downloads or pictures or videos that not everybody is getting, then go check out patreon.com slash DSM podcast and see what all we've got to offer over there. You can follow the podcast here on Instagram or Twitter at, at DSM podcast. All my social medias are at Jacob Stiefel and I run all that shit. So say, Hey, follow, like comment, do whatever makes you happy. That's what I want you to do. So happy new year, my beautiful, beautiful people and friends and family out there. Happy 2018. Here we go. Let's do it. Hope you have a great day. I'll talk to you again soon. Well, drinking was forbidden in my Christian country home. I learned to play the flat top on a southern gospel song. And I heard about the bar room. Just across the Georgia line Where a boy can make a living Playing guitar late at night Never learned about the ladies I was too young to understand Why the young girls fall in love With the boys in the band And when the boys turn to music Girls just turn away to some other guitar picker in some other late night place. And I held on to my music. I let the ladies walk away. Took my songs and dreams to Nashville. And I moved on to LA, up to New York City, all across the USA. I've lost so much of me But there's enough of me to say That my home's in Alabama No matter where I lay my head My home's in Alabama I'm southern keeps me going I don't know it can't be the money this chance knows I'm always broke can it be the satisfaction of being understood when the people really love it they let you know what is good but I'll speak my southern English just as natural as I please I'm in the heart of Dixie And Dixie's in the heart of me Someday when I make it When luck 
finds my way at the foot of Lookout Mountain. I'm gonna smile, cry, and say that my home's in Alabama. No matter. Alabama, I'm Southern born and Southern bred. Southern born, Southern bred. Think about a song. Well, could they try to keep it down? I was up kind of late last night. Well, I'm feeling like I usually feel after I feel all right. I don't want to hear another word about the morning. I can't take the light. Could they try to keep it down? Tune your guitar again Cause it's attitude This is cold weather 